But I was reading through the papers this morning and throughout sort of the preceding week. And I love the research. It's really, really like when I was in university, when I was reading like sociology or history academic papers, I found them very dry and they're difficult to relate to. But the ones that I was looking at, particularly the bullshitting one, the euphemism one, and then sort of the perception of morality one, I found those three really, really fascinating. And one of the questions that sort of Manet had asked me to sort of ask you guys, because I think it would be an interesting opener, but what was the motivations for going down that research avenue? Like a lot of the things talk about linguistics, the importance of language and framing and signaling. Is this something that sort of one person was responsible for that, or is something that you all put together? I think it's a little bit of both. So most of these projects have, you know, maybe one person started with an original idea and then it just becomes collaborative. So our lab, especially like pre-COVID, was a really lively place in terms of every day we pretty much just you know, stop by each other's offices, which was right next to each other, and just talk about these ideas. And and they wouldn't even be necessarily framed as research. Sometimes you just see something in the world and you're like, this is interesting to me. And sometimes it would lead to research. Now, a lot of those conversations just were interesting conversations, didn't lead anywhere. But those papers that you reference kind of started out in that way. Um, I know for the morality uh, paper, I think it started out with uh, just a text between me and Martin, randomly talking about whether or not it would be, we would feel at its worst if a person, like a car dealer, screwed you over and had an incentive for doing so, or just for no reason. They had no incentive and they, they screwed you over anyway. So, like that little conversation, you know, far down the line led to talking about whether or not, you know, if people have this reason, but the reason itself is immoral, how does that influence, you know, perceptions of morality? Yeah, um, it's always yeah. great when something occurs to you and then you bring it up to people who you think are smart and who have interesting ideas and they disagree about what is sort of intuitive about it. Um, and in an environment like that, you can get a lot of um, sort of like a, a direction on where to take it because it's like, okay, I think if you're going to, if, if, if a car if a car salesman was to rip me off, I'd like that they were benefiting from it maybe. Or I'd, uh, and, and you might uh, disagree. You might be like, oh, um, like someone who you who you like trust and expect to to have sort of like uh, what's it called uh, meaningful feedback has like a reasonable opinion in the opposite direction and if you can have that kind of environment then it's like it's excellent um, you right. can have sorry to interrupt me you, you, you reference um, no country for old men and the lead I guess the antagonist and one of the questions that you were sort of grappling with is how do you deal with someone whose motives are destructive, but sorry, whose actions are destructive, but whose more motives and inspiration is really question, questionable and dubious. And you don't really understand. It's one thing if someone's evil, but you sort of understand their rationale for it. Someone is maybe a religious fundamentalist and they sort of want to wreak havoc because of achieving those goals. But when someone is sort of dubious and difficult to differentiate why they're doing something, it adds questionable layers to our evaluation. Yeah, I feel like you can work around a person who's, you know, really immoral, but you understand why they're being immoral, right? So maybe they're just motivated by money. And so if I'm walking down the street, let's say, and I start getting mugged and the person just wants to steal my phone and wallet, I can just give them my phone and wallet and presumably stop getting hit. But a person who I just can't interpret what they want, they want nothing from me, then I don't, that seems almost, that seems scarier. Um, and you kind of get the sense in like, we saw some, we looked at like news articles when coming up with this idea. And it seemed like there were some cases where people just, you know, there was a random assault. People had no idea why this person punched someone on the sidewalk or whatnot, or whatever the assault was. And the comments to those kind of articles, and even the articles themselves, it, it kind of felt more evil. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of what our study picked up on as well. I, I think it might evoke something like the fear of the unknown too, where if a person has reasonable human desires such as wealth or status then it's like okay i know how to interact with this person because at the very least i know i can relate to the kind of things they like but if the person just seems to want uh like senseless directionless destruction say um it's kind of like extra scary because it's like i can't even relate to this person as another moral entity they're just um like a force kind of and i think um, a fiction has picked up on that uh which is why we referenced that uh um, the No Country for Old Men is like that character feels kind of more like a force of 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 nature or, or like uh, enacting the will of some like cruel uh, god or something more than he feels like a human with human motivations. 
Um, and I think that that is like a powerful, um, a powerful thing to evoke, um, to sort of stimulate imagination in fiction and uh, make us feel quite like very uneasy. Um, and that was kind of a, like a, a big inspiration, like kind of like who, what, what kind of makes the scariest villain kind of thing is, uh, is how we ended up framing some of that. And I think uh, that uncertainty with what they, they might want or are motivated by is a huge, um, a huge factor in, in determining how scary they might be. Did the yeah. findings change your impression of what you originally went into the research with? Did did either of you guys sort of have different opinions about what the actual results would show and it changed your mind when you actually saw the statistics of it? That's a good question. I, I think both of us were very somewhat uncertain of how the results would turn out because we weren't just pitting unpredictable agents against predictable agents. We had the predictable agents do more harm. Like so, for example, we had compared the the moral judgments or character judgments of someone who just punched someone for no reason or punched someone while robbing a bank and needing to escape, essentially. And so, on one hand, yeah, the unpredictable person feels less moral, uh, less trustworthy, etc. But also, they're not, con- uh, you know, participating in this extra immoral act, which is robbing a bank. And, and you know, and we had other ones as well, like home invasion and whatnot. But so we were actually. We were not sure. Um, and that's that's one of the cool things about doing research is, is those type of topics where you're actually not sure how the findings will come out. And it's kind of a sign that, you know, A, they'll be interesting to you and also to other people. I think um, a priori, like ahead of time, we knew that predictability would matter. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were um, quite surprised that uh, it, it might be the case that um, uh, like a person like Alex said, who could do two harms would be perceived uh, as, as less, um, as more moral than somebody who uh, d- did um, only one of those harms uh, purely because of the, the source of their motivations for doing it. Uh, and that was really cool and surprising. Um, but we we did know ahead of time, like, we think predictability will matter because stability in like interpersonal relationships uh, matters quite a bit for sort of coalition formation, uh, exchange, et cetera. Um, but yeah, that was uh, fairly surprising. Yeah, and that I think ties into, and I believe that's the paper we're talking about, but you also sampled or included a sample of the Dani people in Papua. Mm-hmm. And I find that fascinating because I think that really adds some type of cultural bridge that it's not something which is sort of North American or something which is maybe for people applying to people who live in major cities, but this is something which is perhaps even deeper and evolutionary in the way we socialize and build relationships and how societies hopefully will function, even if they're complex or not as complex. Yeah, that was a, a great opportunity to test on uh, the Danny people. That was um, uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Peter uh, Sarakowski. Um, mm-hmm. He has a really interesting uh, job where he seems to go to a bunch of, of these uh, locales with people living um, hunter-gatherer or uh, um, very early sort of agricultural lives and uh, test all sorts of um psychological experiments and such with these people and has built up like a nice a personal relationship with the various uh, tribes and uh, and chiefs of uh, um, uh, the various people groups. And uh, so when it, it came up that uh, we had the opportunity to test this kind of work on um, uh, that indigenous population, I was like, oh, that's that's awesome. That's going like, to add quite a bit to, uh, like you said, generalizability potentially. It, um, people... Um, I don't know my read of the of the people are are seem to be suspicious of um, evolutionary explanations for things mm-hmm. in academia, but when you do demonstrate a, an effect like that in a uh, a, a non industrial um, indigenous population, then it, it does go a little bit further in saying, okay, it's probably a little bit more parsimonious that these intuitions were inherited uh, commonly um, early on in in human history than. Um, sort of an idiosyncratic development of Western life. And I guess Um, from what you're saying or from what the research shows is that there's also a purpose. There's actually a complex mechanism that's sort of at play in terms of social bonding and relationship forming, which has a value. Like it's not sort of a superfluous thing, which we do as humans, but that actually has a true core purpose to us being able to collaborate and work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of the kind of literature we tie our results into take kind of an evolutionary perspective. And uh, so one of the things, for example, like kind of person perception theories of moral judgments, they talk about how important it is for people to be able to know, you know, who might harm them and who would be a, you know, a good person to cooperate with. And so these kind of character judgments 
are kind of fundamental to you know how we view people's actions and the perceptions we um, we make of them. Right, and I think that ties into I think one of the other major overarching themes which I pulled out from your writings, which is sort of this seems to be in the background of this idea of Machiavellianism and self interest. And I think this was fascinating when it came to uh, BS as a signal. And as well, looking at euphemistic language, well, I guess we can talk about that, but it seems to be that it's a core human function to be able to decipher and understand what someone else is saying and being able to distinguish their true intentions from sort of false intentions and signals. And what do you think about that idea of sort of Machiavellianism or personality traits sort of being in the background of some of the research that you guys do? Uh, it's absolutely um, at least part of it. There is... Um uh, I, I, I feel like I need to, I got to look up. I'm terrible at, uh, remembering the authors of papers that I read. I just kind of like get right to the content. Uh, but there is a Machiavellian view of intelligence, um, which, uh, I think has now become a broader social brain hypothesis, but the basic idea was, um, it, it in its, uh, conception, the notion was we are intelligent in order to trick other people. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is sort of now evolved into being like, okay, we do trick each other and that's a good reason to be smart, but we also cooperate. We also engage in trade with each other. We also do all sorts of things that are, are socially geared that aren't necessarily, uh, so Machiavellian. Um, and so a, a direct inspiration. Um, mm-hmm. and so sorry to interrupt Alex, but like, go ahead. what you say is the analog? Cause I guess we were looking at before being able to predict, um, decision making in terms of utility and deontology. Now, for here, what is the, if you're looking at it from an evolutionary perspective, what is the value of being able to BS? What is the social value or the individual's self interest value in terms of being able to BS somebody or to signal in some way? Well, we talk about uh, in our Bullshit Makes the Art Grow Profounder paper, we talk about introducing uh, bullshit ability or, or bullshit more generally as a low cost strategy to achieve you know, prestige in prestige awarding domains. Um, and so what we show is if you take an art piece and, and we had um, you know, art pieces created by artists and ones created by research assistants just with computer tools, um, either way, if we randomly generate uh, a pseudo profound bullshit title, which is essentially kind of a uh, you know a random mishmash of profound sounding words, <laughs> just a- randomly attaching that to art pieces makes them seem more profound. Mm-hmm. And so that's pretty low cost in terms of specifically with a website, I can just click a button, get this you know profound sounding words, and put it to my art. And I don't even have to like try to select what title fits the art. Just <laughs> you know put it with any art, and it makes it more profound. At least in our studies. And so that's a pretty low cost strategy to, you know, making your art seem more profound or more generally kind of gaining prestige in this prestige awarding domain. Yeah. Like it reminds me of that famous case. I think it was in New York or somewhere where someone had put a banana on a wall in an art Mm -hmm. exhibition and someone had taken it down and eaten it. And it was actually part of the exhibition. I think someone had actually bought that thing or someone had put like a toilet in the middle of a museum and people were sort of sitting around and analyzing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've seen a similar one of like discarded glasses. (laughs) <laughs> just like someone lost their glasses or whatever and it's like oh and what, uh, that one might have been that one might have been a bit though actually um what's the reception of your peers and also sort of like the academic community when you come out with these findings because i think they're really telling i think about human nature and about intimate human nature and sometimes they don't seem to have sort of the posh veneer of maybe academic writing but i think like it's so relevant i think it's more relevant than most research to everyday life it's it's very funny for me uh, with with such observations because uh, you'll you'll talk about your your bullshitting research in with other colleagues and they kind of like are polite the the way people tend to be uh, but you you get the sense that they they don't think it's like a real discipline a real thing to study and then and then you'll go on into like uh, your little like committee meetings or brown bags or whatever like a little get togethers with other academics and people will start complaining about how. Um, uh, discussion sections and papers are full of nonsense that people are just wildly speculating, uh, and they're they're unfairly getting like um, maybe like a, a paper in a better journal than they ought to because they were able to write something um, sort of stimulating in a discussion. And it's like it's sort of like a dual. This is a dumb, uh, and not everyone. Some people are very receptive to it uh, and and do recognize like I I think it is important for revealing something very fundamentally human. Um, but it's really funny to see the the sort of duality there where it's um, not, this is dumb and stupid and important and it, it really affects my life in negative ways every day. Um, so it's very funny. Um, yeah, it comes off as, um, 
I, I've had a sense where like in, you know, research talks or, or posters where they're like, oh, this is really interesting. This is, but they treat it more as like, oh, this is kind of a cute, fun project. Like, you know, I'm sure you do actual science on the side, but this is also kind of cute and, right. you know, interesting. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I guess we, especially, I think this only really applies to the, the bullshit work, but maybe it comes off as kind of a lack of seriousness, which look, we have a lot of fun with the research ideas. I mean, we, everything we publish, you know, we try to make sure we find it interesting and that it would be good to, you know, have a conversation over beers, let's say. Um, but we also like, you know, there's parts to take serious and those parts are taken very serious, like the methodology, the data, uh, you know, the data analysis. So you can take those things seriously, make a solid scientific paper, but also have, you know, an interesting or kind of fun, uh, quirky idea. Right. And so I guess it, our papers kind of have both, or at least the bullshit papers have both sides of that. Right. So the, on a serious note, then how did the bullshit paper advance the literature or how did it challenge sort of the orthodoxy of looking at signaling and intelligence? Yeah. So with, and I'll let Martin answer the second part of that question, but for, you know, studies of, you know, pseudo profound bullshit specifically, um, it's very new field. Our, uh, a uh, former lab mate, Gordon Pennycook, actually started the field in a sense uh, by in a 2015 paper looking at pseudo profound bullshit. And there, the focus was largely on whether or not individuals, you know, fall for bullshit or fall prey to bullshit. And they talk about why, what kind of individuals. So individuals that are maybe into more intuitive thinkers than, you know, more reflective thinkers. And uh, they also, or we came up with a paper after that talking about also individual differences and in who falls for bullshit. And so we said, you know, along with this kind of reflective intuitive uh, distinction, it's also people who have a tendency to see patterns where no patterns exist. And so we showed that. With the art paper, we said, okay, people fall for pseudo profound bullshit. And we showed that, and, and there are certain types of people who may fall for it more regularly than others. But what's the consequence of that? What about other people taking advantage of the fact that people are susceptible to pseudo profound bullshit? Yeah, and how does that play out? And that's kind of what we uh, started to investigate with the art paper. Mm -hmm. One way to like take advantage of people's susceptibility to pseudo profound bullshit. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of uh, challenging some sort of singular entrenched uh, orthodoxy. There, I don't think there is in academia. There are often just camps form. So there are various perspectives that kind of compete uh, on the nature of of any sort of um, human activity. One thing we do, which might be um, challenging for uh, cognitive people, is that we are we are uh, in cognition, so um, cognitive psychology. Um, but we are more interested in looking at social processes and. Um, the sort of thinking outcomes that come when multiple brains interact together, mm -hmm. which um, cognitive people in general tend to really like single brains, uh, single minds. They send us, they send to like, what is going on in the, the, the human cognitive system? Mm -hmm. um, and on my perspective, generally, I won't claim that this is also Alex's, but I think uh, our species is, is far more interesting when there's more than one brain present mm -hmm. in any activity. Um, and only studying the output of a single brain is, is probably a really highly artificial sort of setup. Um, another sort of perspective is we kind of we add more information or more evidence for uh, intelligence being with that one particular paper with intelligence being geared towards social purposes. So we didn't spend much of our, our evolutionary history going around solving puzzles, like little, little puzzles that people construct for us. We spent most of our time entangled in social networks and uh, needing to navigate those. And so we sort of add to an existing body of evidence that says intelligence is for, or was a, a, at least initially formed for the purposes of social navigation. Um, and I, I think you'll, you'll probably, I don't want to uh, make claims about any particular person's disagreement, but a classical view of intelligence would be more about intelligence as it relates to our ability to manipulate the physical world. Um, and that's, that's, we kind of depart from that perspective there. Um, so yeah, I think in, in some, um, we add more evidence to a more socially geared notion of intelligence for that at least one paper, and we are more interested in multiple brains and the ways that multiple brains interact than single brains or minds. And speaking to that social complexity of having several different minds interacting with one another, it sort of prompted me to think about this idea of sort of virtue signaling and also sort of like this idea of like hidden voters, like hidden Trump voters or hidden Brexit voters. Like sometimes people will publicly profess something. I think this is also picked up probably in economics um, in terms of hidden preferences, but in terms of the idea that people will avow something, I guess socially there could be a socially beneficial 
self-interest towards it, but in private, they actually will diverge considerably with that. Did that come across in your research? Did that prompt any future avenues for exploration for you guys? Uh, I don't know about that specifically, but something related is with the uh, euphemism work, Mm -hmm. it was really started to become motivated or one of the kind of initial motivations for it was just looking at events uh, being reported by such specifically polarizing events and looking at the same event be reported completely in completely different ways and and maybe the facts were the same but the terms used to you know describe the people acting in the event or whatnot were completely different so to you know give an example there was a whole Lindsay shepherd case that yeah. happened uh right you know local right uh across the street from us right. at wilford laurier and you see the articles about her and she's either, you know, uh, transphobic, whatever, or a free speech warrior, right? Like these are the labels. And, and the, the facts are the same. They talk, talk about, you know, her showing the Jordan Peterson video to class and or, or any, any follow-up tweets. But the terms used, and, and those are kind of an extreme example, but just, you know, even look at like protests when they're reported. Some people, you know, call the protests political activists. Some people call them political extremists, uh, agitators, whatever, right? There's different terms we can use, and that kind of skews uh, it falls about or along political lines usually, and it can kind of skew people's perceptions of these events. Mm-hmm. And is there any way to step out of that framework? Because it seems like it's so difficult to, like, for instance, like, I'm, like, I'm a vegan. I'm not an activist crazy one, but mm-hmm. like you guys talked about in the article, the difference between sort of saying slaughterhouse versus a meatpacking plant. Mm-hmm. And like, it seems like humans are... Sh- I'm not sure if it's political bias or whatnot, but we think very clearly in binaries. We like to think one or the other. Like it's sort of hard to add. Are there nuanced words that can sort of bridge the gap and bring different mindsets together, or do yeah, we still that's, pray to one or the other? That's a really good question because some label has to be used, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we kind of in the paper we're kind of agnostic about which label is deceptive and which one you know is accurate because it really depends on what's being described, right? Um, one thing that our paper does show is that if you know, if you have all the details of an event, like, you know, let's say for your meat processing plant, uh, slaughterhouse example, if yeah. you know exactly what the workers are doing in their day to day life, you know exactly what's going on there, mm-hmm. then whatever word is used doesn't really affect you as much. And so, and you can look at this with protests as well. If you know what actually happened at the protest, then you could, you're better able to ignore the label and just actually make your own decision based on, you know, events right. that occurred. Yeah, I find it fascinating. And I'm trying to remember in the paper if it was addressed, but this was something which was done sort of through articles or was this spoken word? Like, does it make a difference what medium is it's being communicated over? Or is this something which is just sort of a universal phenomenon in terms of communication? We haven't tested uh, spoken communication. So we used text based. So everything was through text. But that's, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I assume it would have a similar. Uh, effect with spoken word, but that's something to be tested. It's, it's actually uh, not quite true. We had um, one honors the oh, right, undergraduate yeah. student who leads an independent project. Um, she, um, Nina Gabbert, um, she took um, instances of bullshitting, double speak, and uh, recorded odd people saying them in an audio mm-hmm. um, uh, on a mic, and uh, and and had people rate both the audio format and the reading, and there was no difference. It didn't seem to be so. We have done that sort of simple uh, little cognitive test about that, and and it seemed to be the case that um, n- no real difference uh, exists between whether or not the 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 stimuli itself is audio or um, or visual uh, text. Um, but in terms of uh, the real world, that's the the. The context in which we studied it was a, a fairly sterile lab environment, right. and so there could be something about uh, the way things can be said in like rhetoric and, and sort of uh, oration, where it can, you, if you're able to add a little bit of flourish to the way that you you say or share something, um, that might be able to make it quite a bit more convincing. If it's aesthetically pleasing, maybe it um, it sort of like gets past one layer of your guard, kind of thing. Right, and then mm-hmm. does the research. From my perspective, when I read it, I guess I'm already maybe a more skeptical person, but from your perspective, it must seem like it would scare the shit out of you. Like, do you have sort of like a massive mode up before you interact with any content online? Like, are you always thinking about the specific wording of language, um, the communicator's interest and self-interest? Like, it seems to be that it's very tough to 
take someone at face value. And it seems like there's a lot of deconstruction sometimes, like if you are mm. reading an article or when someone is trying to make you a pitch, whether it's for a car or a politician, that there's so many layers of analysis to truly understand maybe where someone is coming from and what their intention is with you. Yeah. My, my, uh, sorry, go ahead, Martin. Sorry. Yeah. Um, my personal response when I see such manipulations is, are more like, ha ha, I see what they did there. Like, that's funny. <laughs> like, um, you caught it. once you notice it, it, it's kind of like entertaining. Like, uh, like, oh, that's, I can, I can see that they, they've used this like sort of weaselly word. That's pretty funny. Um, so mine is more of like amusement, um, how I respond to it in the day to day. Um, but that, uh, that might just be like a, my default response to, to many things. It's just like, oh, it's amusing. That's fun. Interesting. Um, yeah. I, it must be how like those early researchers studying cognitive biases must felt when they revealed all these cognitive biases. It's like, we can't even trust our own brains, right? We're doing all these shortcuts and whatnot. But, uh, but no, I think, it's kind of similar to Martin. It is for me, it's just when I try to make opinions without, and this is, you know, I probably fail at this a lot, but if you, if someone's talking about, for example, someone's in trouble for having said something or made some argument, I try to not even read the kind of the journalist perspective on it. Just go, what did they say? And right. then evaluate. And then, and you know, you don't always have to do that. Some luckily, you know, Martin and I, we don't have to make a lot of important decisions, right? So we can be kind of just entertained by an article or whatnot. Um, but if, if there was something more, uh, when you're about to make like an important decision, uh, I don't know whether it's a, uh, voting or something more personal to you or whatever, then you might really want to just uh, learn as much as possible. I mean, definitely with our, uh, with our work, right. We try to, um, you know, just learn and get as much details about anything we're commenting on. Um, and so, like, yeah. For me, I guess it stands out like it must be deeply unsettling in the sense that the intellectual ecosystem, journalists, and maybe acad academics as well, not necessarily nefariously, but they inject bias. And then mm -hmm. us as consumers of information sort of have our own biases and our inability to sort of distinguish or differentiate sometimes maybe dog whistles or certain language. So is that a very, does it reflect something about sort of the limitations of a human cognition? Is there, are there, I know it's obviously a very generalized and sort of hypothetical question, but are there places or avenues for improvement and being able to communicate intellectually and understand one another? Cause it seems like with every conflict that you have, any dispute, there's always going to be someone who's going to be manipulating it left or right. And there's going to be an incentive. Is there any way to sort of step outside of that equation? It's a, it's a really good question. I think, um, I think having a preference for things to be true, like wanting to know what the truth is, that's probably a, a relatively recent acquisition for humans to be interested in. Um, oh. There is a fundamental need for humans to make sense of things. So humans don't want their, in general, um, their 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 day to day life to sort of be kind of like a fog. They they want like this is where I am, this is where I'm going, um, and they they want to be able to tell themselves a story of of uh, how these various uh, events and points connect. And and the desire to have that story that makes sense is only occasionally in line with what is actually true about the world. Um, and so because I, I don't know how um, necessarily um, entrenched this is, the fact that there's going to be some distance between truth and sense making and what people want from the world, I, I don't know if it will ever be necessarily eliminated. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can maybe do some stuff to mitigate. Like we had, like Alex mentioned, um, having people know as much uh, of the facts as possible, it, it gives them fewer affordances to... Um, to deny things like if if you are faced with an uncomfortable truth and you know x y and z facts versus like oh you kind of vaguely are familiar with the topic um the more you know about it, it you think it, it almost starts staring you right, like right in the face it's like you have to put effort into being uh continuing to be ignorant the more knowledgeable you are um so i might endorse like i don't know ancient wisdom of just accumulating knowledge and that is hopefully true although that like you said um baked into this is that the accumulation of knowledge is is um, is, is itself uh, at risk of of um, being right. quite biased? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah, maybe you know, there's, and I haven't looked into this too much, but you know, maybe you hope for some sort of wisdom of the crowds, where even if individuals are biased in the aggregate, you know, mm -hmm. the truth kind of you know comes to the top. And I, I don't even know if that's the case, but that's you know a hypothesis. Um, but another way you can maybe navigate this is through, you know, source information. For mm -hmm. example, if someone was manipulative in the past or dishonest in the past, you discredit their future uh, words to some extent. What happens with doublespeak? And I think we do that with lying. That's uh, so a lot of uh, researchers, you know, they wonder 
with the incentives to lie, why don't people lie more? Well, how is all this, how is our communication relative, like mostly honest with all the, you know, where, you know, people can lie. And um, one of the reasons or one of the main hypotheses is because, well, if you get caught lying, your reputation suffers, right? There's costs, there's punishments. People don't like liars. Mm -hmm. Um, With doublespeak, what we find, this is part of our paper, um, is that you can use double speed. You can selectively, like interchangeably, use political activist or political extremist in some situations, or enhance interrogation or torture to refer to an interrogative act. And people view it as mostly truthful, mo- like not that deceptive, and you know, largely permissible. Like obviously not, you know, entirely. And there'll be some individuals in our sample who do see these things as, you know, deceptive and uh, you know, dishonest. But there is different consequences for saying something objectively false mm-hmm. uh, versus saying something that, you know, you kind of use a label that fits your side, let's say, your political side, I- ideological side, uh, what have you. Right. That's a really interesting thought. And it made me think, so to build on that, like you can think of something like murder. Most people don't want to murder anybody. Uh, most people probably don't really want to lie to each other. A lot of people are quite nice and they don't want to um, mistreat others or, or do something that they uh, they know will, will uh, hurt other people's feelings or cause them misery. Um, but what you just said, Alex, made me really think is like, I wonder if... Um, Double speak, say, or bullshitting um, might present people who are highly agreeable or nice the opportunity to sort of delude themselves and allow themselves to uh, indulge in the pleasure of lying to people or the benefits of lying to people without um, without like sort of sacrificing their self concept. So if I can engage in double speak instead of directly lying, I don't have to feel as bad a person because this is a reasonable way you could describe a situation. And so that was just a straight thought. That, and, uh, and to build off that, there's a flip side to that. So you're talking about using double speak to maybe you know smooth things over, um, present something more agreeable. And for sure, calling or refusing to call people out on something that seems maybe deceptive to you, but you're not sure, it's not objectively false. You can't point to like, yeah, you said this and this didn't happen. That might also be you know related to agreeableness. Because, you know, like I said, people calling someone's a liar is a big accusation, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so more agreeable people might not be willing to do that without the evidence, right? Without, with just a hunch that, hey, this isn't, this is kind of a self-serving way to describe this, rather than, no, you said this and that this was not the case. It's it's a very interesting process, I notice on, say, Twitter, where um, instead of picking a person who has made any specific claim about, um, say, any popular um, leftist or right uh, political movement and saying they made these claims and they're not true. It's always m- uh, in vague reference to somebody, some um, nebulous group, like uh, the left want you to do this or the right want you to do this, where it's like, okay, just pick a person who made that claim and and call them out directly. But there's a big reputational risk for doing that. And, and I, I think like by by not sort of directly calling people out, you're still able to indulge in all that moral, like self-righteousness, that feeling where it's like, oh, I'm a good guy here um, fighting some uh, fight without putting yourself at risk at all. Um, so yeah. it, it's that's an interesting thing I've noticed uh, online. Right. It's funny, the reaction to our paper. So we got some, uh, it was on post on Reddit Science and a lot of the comments, we got a lot of comments. And a lot of them were just like, yeah, this proves how, you know, this left-wing person was deceptive. Or, and then the next comments, this proves how that right-wing person was deceptive and uses, you know, linguistic manipulation. And so people are just taking it to yeah, kind of do what, what uh, to some extent, what Martin was saying, like just, mm-hmm. you know, using it as uh, evidence for, you know, people being manipulative. And I, you know, I think, Martin and I would probably both agree. Yeah, this is more of a person thing, not really a left wing or a right wing thing. This is it's, a, a, a fact it's an interesting people. question, though. Like they were going to make that conclusion no matter what, probably, mm-hmm. and it just so happened to be that our paper was in the, their uh, line of sight. So it's yeah. uh, um, in, in a way, it can probably make you feel like, oh, what did we contribute in terms of like everyday political discourse or casual discourse? What did we really contribute? They were going to make that conclusion no matter what the paper was. <laughs> um, right. We have a couple more minutes, so in case we get booted out, we'll just pick it up in the next Zoom call. Okay. But it's funny, it reminds me, I was listening to Joe Rogan, and he was speaking to someone about the concept of parasitic ideas, bringing epidemiology's sort of intellectual environment. And that he was, was God sad, right? It was a more recent one. It's similar. He wrote a book recently about that, but there was another guy on like a couple of days ago. But he told the story about how a flat earther died and he went to the pearly gates and he speaks to God and he asked him, like, and God asked him, you can have any answer to any question you want. And he wants to know about flat earth. And God says, sorry, no. It's not a flat earth. We have a sphere and everything like that. And then he like smacks himself in the face. Like the conspiracy goes even higher than I expected. (laughs) (laughs) Or going to your point of like people, this confirmation bias, people will always be looking for evidence supporting their claims and that it's so hard to sort of get around that. It's such a, 
I'm not sure what the research is, and I guess it's hard. We're going to try to fit into three minutes and see if it continues over. But like, what is the research on confirmation bias in terms of an evolutionary purpose? Like, why would we have sort of this inbuilt mechanism to only consult information which supports our claims when it actually might not be beneficial to us? I think it can be quite motivating. If you think that you have it, you've got it um, perfectly, and you don't need to second guess yourself, that you, you'll be willing to take action. Um, I think if you're if you're somebody who's careful and considered, and maybe even uh, ponderous, you you might just um, if the environment supports action over inaction, those mm-hmm. ponderous, honest people who are going to be thinking until uh, the last minute before they actually do something, they're going to take fewer actions. And if the uh, especially if the environment can tolerate you taking the wrong action multiple times. Um, it might be the case that just whatever pushes you to do more stuff is the advantageous. Um, and it's only recently that we start to really care for truth, maybe for its aesthetic value, as well as for practical purposes. Um, yeah, I mean, just to take to add to that, uh, it seems to be like not everyone's, I mean, I know I'm actually just saying this up like it's some controversial or hot take, but I think it's pretty obvious. It, truth isn't always our main value, right? So part of another competing value uh, might be something like community or identity or the social implications of holding a viewpoint, especially publicly. And so with regards to confirmation bias, let's just say if I put forward an idea and, uh, publicly and I have a, all my friends agree with that idea, and it's maybe part of my identity to some extent, it's going to be really hard to you know, go back on that, regardless of the evidence. We're going to be more, we, we're going to be more motivated to look for evidence that supports our uh, idea, especially when it's entrenched in our identity and uh, perhaps our community. Mm-hmm. Are there any demographic or maybe thinking about Jonathan Haidt and his work on like moral foundations, are there specific character traits or values in which someone would be more likely to be a strategic speaker when it comes to use of euphemisms? Like, are there certain characteristics or is this is something which is just sort of a universal, doesn't matter if you're left or right, if you're high on certain sacredness or openness values? So this will be um, a, uh, I guess, a prediction because we haven't specifically tested Mm -hmm. a lot of the individual differences as it relates to the deployment of such strategies. Um, But being highly status seeking has, has got to be one. Um, I would think of, as well as uh, we we kind of speculate in one of our papers, I forget which one now it, uh, it is, about the uh, role personality might play. Probably people who are um, highly agreeable might tend to engage in more um, bullshitting or, or deflection. And I think um, one of our colleagues, Shane Luttrell, he's done some really good work about uh, bullshitting. Um, they might be, they might tend to engage in more def- uh, ref- um deflection so if somebody says um somebody buys you a sweater that you absolutely uh dislike instead of saying oh i hate this sweater or i like this sweater i can say oh this is a very thoughtful gift or it's very nice that you got this for me it's like i I can express um positivity without sort of um needing to get nailed down to any particular claim or criticism and that could be freeing for agreeable people so probably different profiles along personality axes uh, they probably differ in the kinds of um, deceptive language they might tend to agree in. Some being more like, you can think of like the classic difference between like a white lie, quote unquote, um, versus like a, a really uh, a direct lie. Um, um, being a commission versus omission. Certain people are probably going to leave things out as their strategy for um, misleading people. Some people are just going to straight up lie. Um, right. And it, yeah. sort of, it sort of reminds me of this idea that, like, I guess there's that saying that people who should be politicians will never want to put themselves in that place. And it's sort of like people who are sort of seeking power are more likely to be using it in an artful way, coming to this Machiavellian point or the strategic speaker aspect that maybe the predisposition that a lot of people have to sort of be more thoughtful and be more careful will be sort of um, precluded from entering certain fields, which you don't have maybe an incentive to get ahead or the cost to entry are just like undesirable. Yeah. So, uh, one thing, it's funny you brought this up because I was actually talking about kind of this very question with, with uh, someone else recently. And, and so thinking about who is more likely to use double speak, one, you might just, it might require some level of verbal intelligence, right? Because some, you know, you have to craft a statement that doesn't appear dishonest, but also can be, you know, persuasive. Um, but also uh, just, so A, I think you have to want or have a need to like want to sway public opinion, right? Which a politician obviously has that uh, want you want to be worried about your reputation because one of the functions of double speak is it lets you sway public opinion without that you know the hard hit to your reputation. Let's say if you were caught in a lie, 
Um, and it kind of helps to maybe have time to craft a message. So you'll, you see a lot of these, you know, uh, kind of, and so we pulled from real world examples of double speak in our paper, and a lot of them are kind of lift with, uh, not only politics, but like business, mm-hmm. um, businesses like with uh I, I forget the word for it now but like any sort of press release you know you craft a statement about some topic there's a lot of these kind of right. terms that are kind of ambiguous vague uh euphemistic and so so i think those are kind of and we haven't studied this yet and i i think we will in the near future but uh yeah to answer that question uh about who is using double speak uh you know i think anyone has the capacity to and maybe does to some extent but really the people using it the most are probably those like i said uh, who want to sway public opinion, worried about their reputation, and maybe have high verbal intelligence and or time to craft a message. Mm-hmm. And some of the research touches on Jonathan Haidt, and we talked about those moral foundations. How prevailing or how persuasive is that topology? I'm not sure maybe if you can explain to listeners sort of what the different scales of that moral foundation theory is, but is that something which is sort of universally accepted or uh, going to Martin's point, is that something where there's sort of different camps in academia and some people really strongly support it and some people uh, disagree with that topology. Um, so I think there is some disagreement uh, with whether or not, so I know there's some disagreement with some researchers saying that harm is really the only foundation, moral foundation. So everything can be looked at through the lens of harm. Uh, whereas like obviously, Gray, I guess. Yeah, that's one example. Yeah. He's written a, a, a lot about that. Um, or at least that's been an aspect of some of his other work. The dyadic, um, um, the dyadic um, theory of uh, of harm and morality. I think uh, something approximating that. That's uh, so something Kurt approximating Frame, that. Is an yeah. interesting, uh, a very interesting researcher to look up. Yeah, great researcher. And, and the harm perspective. Yeah. Right. Um, but then Jonathan Haidt and uh, and his colleagues kind of take a different perspective, where saying there's multiple moral foundations. So harm is just one, and I, I think they can see that's probably the most primary. But then there's also um, like stuff like purity considerations or uh i forget i'm drawing a blank here on some of the other ones now like uh mm-hmm. i think loyalty uh oh, appeal to authority uh stuff like that martin if you can if you know some of the ones i'm forgetting feel free to jump yeah in. i think it's like uh care fairness mm-hmm. um uh authority oh. uh loyalty and uh, dis- um sanctity mm-hmm. uh, those are the five with like um a, a candidate in liberty mm-hmm yeah, and they and one of the main findings too is how uh, I believe like liberals and conservatives have different you know moral taste and uh, different conceptions of fairness to some extent, and uh, and uh, using moral foundations theory to kind of explain people's disagreements along these you know controversial topics, let's say. Mm-hmm. And I'm just curious; it just sort of stood out to me in my mind. But the idea that people use euphemisms and strategic speakers has that ever been looked at with the lens of trigger warnings? Because that's also another idea, I guess, of sort of differences in language between sort mm-hmm. of employing certain language versus other language. Is there, has there been any research on that topic? I think I've seen, um, I've, I've seen at least one paper. Um, uh, I, I, and I, I only vaguely recall the result now. Um, I think it might've been something where like having the, the, the trigger warning, um, increases the expectation that the thing will be mm-hmm. like more harmful and that might get people sort of anxiety up, uh, rather than actually being sort of, uh, any, any, alleviation uh, of that kind of anxiety the trigger warning itself might prompt um a negative uh response more so than the actual content um right. is that that's um uh and, and I, I don't want to say that with absolute confidence because i'm only vaguely recalling the result of one paper um mm-hmm. but at, at the very least that would be i, I wonder if uh, trigger warnings would really even count uh, if they'd be even the same uh like if do they share much of a family resemblance i guess with double speak do you think alex like uh yeah, I'd have to think about that more. It is, it is. There are differences. I guess the the similarity is that they are usually euphemistic, and I'm not sure. I'm not that familiar with trigger warnings, but and correct me if I'm wrong, Ari. But I, I think they're usually kind of. Or what's what's an example? What would be an example of a, a trigger warning? Yeah, I think it would literally just be um like a trigger warning. Yeah, uh, we just say something that. Yeah, so like let's say there was a story about let's say like um Huckleberry Finn. Like now they may have trigger warnings or entirely remove the N-word from the book itself, or there would be a warning ahead of time saying this content will be dealing with um, racist pejoratives and stuff like that. Or same with like sexual assault and rape cases um, Mm -hmm. or stories that would have a similar trigger. I guess it's, yeah, in in the sense it's not a word, it's not like a specific word. I don't think that people are replacing, say, rape or sexual assault, but they would be sort of an advanced warning system sort of saying, 
watch out for that. So maybe that was a poor question, but I guess I was just curious about sort of the state of the research in terms of euphemism with that. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I, I'll, I'll speak for myself, but it also seems like uh, Martin and I don't have too mm-hmm. much knowledge uh, about that work. Um, but I see the connection. Yeah, I guess the larger connection would be if people are uh, replacing words within the, these texts uh, that are, you know, uh, triggering or, you know, taking, changing the content itself um, would be most similar, I, I guess, to doublespeak. But even then it would be for a different purpose, right? So it'd be to spare feelings as opposed to persuade anyone. I know there's um, a lot of discussion about it in terms of, uh, I know, um, uh, Jonathan Haidt as well. Uh, was mm-hmm. it uh, Greg Glukianoff, yes. his co-author? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. They talk about it in the context of safetyism a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that there is a uh, Another perspe- perspective from, say, like um, a Taleb uh, Nassim, mm-hmm. uh, Nicholas Nassim Taleb, I believe is his full name, yeah. um, with uh, anti fragility. Uh, mm-hmm. So, I guess, in, under that perspective, there's been um, if you deprive the system of um, disturbance by um, let's, let's assume that trigger warnings work perfectly, and once you saw it, you sort of like um, blanked out the, the, the purported offensive stimuli. Um, that that um, uh, limits your potential for growth in the response to what your system does to compensate for that momentary discomfort. Um, mm. So I think uh, those two perspectives probably share a lot in common. Sort of the um, safetyism kind of makes us all weak and scared, and then anti-fragility, we have the opportunity to grow from momentary discomfort. Uh, so, uh, but uh, and those aren't necessarily purely; imp- those are more higher-level theoretical synthesis type works. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk about any maybe research that you guys are currently working on in terms of sort of future research? What uh, things you're currently collecting data on or early findings that you have on unpublished papers at the moment? That's a good, Martin, you want to, you want to touch on that? Um, I don't even remember what, um, if we have any bullshitting work in the, in the pipeline right now. Yeah. Um <laughs> I, we're we, uh, we're doing uh, some stuff with um, economic reasoning with some of our like undergraduate um, like thesis students and such. Um, I yeah. uh, we are collecting more data on the the moral papers that we talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of mostly not really uh, coming up with you know entirely new findings, but mostly like testing boundary conditions uh, of our current findings. So, uh, for example, we've collected some data recently. Um, about what is meant by predictability. So we have this finding, obviously, that you know uh, more predictable immoral agents are judged better than less predictable immoral agents. Um, and then we get into a little bit. Well, what when we when people are answering about a agent's predictability, what are they really? You know, what are they uh, responding to? Is it a person's consistency? Is it the interpretability of their motives? What not? So we have some work on that. We're also testing uh, uh, these findings in the context of not just telling people what occurred, but actually showing them a video of an assault um, and then telling them about the motives. Um, So stuff like that. But really, actually, we're in a kind of exciting time right now where it's almost back to the drawing board. I feel like, you know, maybe go back a year or so, we had all these really interesting ideas and it was just about executing them, getting to the point where they're getting published. And now that's almost over. And we're back to the point where, you know, it's time to hopefully right in time with COVID, get back to just talking and seeing, you know, what's next in terms of any uh, interesting ideas. There's tons of directions that we haven't started yet, um, but that we have ideas for. So for example, the double speak stuff, I have this suspicion that, you know, in the context of political polarization with, you know, in some instances, you know, people, let's say left wing people, uh, you know, really disagreeing with vice or right wing people and vice versa. I wonder how much of that is that they're just getting completely different uh, linguistic framings of the same events. So if if we kind of seek out news, which I, I think has been shown, uh, liberals seek out more liberal news outlets, conservatives, more conservative news outlets. If those outlets present the same facts with different linguistic framings, it might seem it might no wonder that they don't agree on the event or or the facts or or rather the conclusions uh, based on whatever happens. So if I go if I learn about a protest and maybe maybe the article has you know what happened at the protest, but one article calls them political extremists, the other political activists. I might seem the people disagreeing with me as kind of ridiculous because it's like, why would you criticize these, you know, political activists? And then they're like, why would you support these political extremists? Right. So stuff like that is uh, one kind of interesting idea we have uh, floating around that we want to test. 
I think I actually buy into um, another notion related to that, where rather than um, the the differences in linguistic framing leading to different perspectives, uh, my suspicion is that uh, there are these sort of ground differences between people and their what sort of their nervous system is set up to prefer. They have these, uh, and maybe it is something like a moral foundations or um, something like that, like something that shares a like a resemblance with that kind of theory, where you can group people up into um, where their innate preferences will tend to lie. And some of these will skew more conservative and some of these will skew more liberal. And the seeking out of information that um, sort of massages those two views is an expression of that difference rather than uh, the cause of that difference is my 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 suspicion. Um, but at the very least, it would still be, there's probably going to be people who are like, with all things, people who are with weak preferences who um, could then be... Uh, influenced by those sort of manipul- um, linguistic framings. Uh, yeah, you wonder if it's kind of like a uh, kind of a reinforcement loop or, or whatnot, where, yeah, your taste kind of push you to, you know, view things that are consistent with that taste. But in doing so, you become farther and farther apart from people with the opposite taste. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's I, it's, it's, it is. A, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Martin. I, I think it's just interesting with the um, when people take things uh, and, and political differences quite seriously. Um, they it's almost like they lose the ability to talk to each other at all. Uh, mm-hmm. It seems like they don't even live in the same universe. Like if uh, if you were to sort of get a picture into their mind, it's like they they don't agree about very basic facts about what what happens in the world. Um, and that's uh, incredibly interesting, just as a uh, like sort of the phenomenology of that, like how, how that, that must uh, experience, like the, the subjective experience of like um, really believing the world is a completely different place than somebody where probably for a lot of these uh, areas of dispute, reasonable people could have disagreements about um, such things. But uh, yeah, that, I just, I'm like I'm very, very amused by that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, they've done research. I know data scientists have done it with Twitter and they've looked at the difference between sort of left-wing and right-wing Twitter. And there's sort of these echo chambers, like people will not see the same news. And it's fascinating because I think it, in some ways it prompts me to think about this idea in your research in terms of having sort of a relativist truth or conception of truth within society versus sort of a universal, because it seems that framing effects and narrative are very important in terms of how we understand things. Like there's no one truth, I guess, like most topically, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, people have diametrically different conceptions of what the truth is and what the narrative events are. What is the causality between what's driving this, what's not driving it? And it seems to suggest maybe with your research, and I guess just with um, psychology in general, cognitive psychology, that this idea that there's sort of one universal truth that everyone agrees to, and it's so bulletproof and clear is sort of coming under legitimate scientific challenge that there are sort of several different, maybe there's a reasonable bell curve under which reasonable opinions can be held. But this idea of a black and white clear as day truth is very under uh, under question, I guess. I think um, we're just, and this is a perspective I take broadly where um, as societies get freer, there are more options for people to explore, um, their preferences will tend to get expressed. So I have a nervous system. I don't know most of the things that my nervous system would really, really like. I don't know the kind of, if I haven't seen the kind of art that I really like, or I haven't uh, eaten the kind of food I really like, or the um, any sort of entertainment, until I experience it, I won't know that, oh, I was kind of set up to like that kind of thing. Um, what happens with the, uh, and in some way you can think of that as being sort of my ground nature. Um, and, and these could be constrained by economic uh, features. Like if, um, my, uh, favorite food is tomato, but I, I was born in a place like, uh, I'm set up to like tomato, like all the the stimuli that a tomato would give me would give me a ton of pleasure, but I was born in a place where tomatoes never grow and have never been. Um, it's not until I try a tomato that I'm going to know, oh, tomatoes are the best thing that I I really like. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is, and this is not like a, uh, uh, an empirically based thing. This is sort of a, a perspective on life that I, will, I maybe will explore uh, empirically. As societies get freer and freer and more options are available for people to explore, we're going to get a, a more naked picture of what human nature is like. We're going to be able to see what people's nervous systems really crave when they have the option um, mm-hmm. to have it. In a certain way, when you are like in drudgery, you're like uh, toiling, eking out a, a subsistence living. You have to pay a lot of attention to what is true or untrue. You can't engage in too much magical thinking unless it supports like a, a temporary relief from um, uh, from misery. Your existence more depends on 
um, knowing what's true and untrue. You need to be able to discover uh, principles about farming, food production, etc. So with people sort of claim this is like a post-truth era, I think what that is, is that's um, we're sort of just revealing that people never really cared that much for the truth at a ground level, other than they had to care about it for practical purposes. And the more that we're able to have these comfortable lives where we can um, uh, engage with all sorts of media in, uh, in in varied ways, truth is less existentially important for most of us. And mm-hmm. and and it's it's just revealing that we never really probably cared about it. It really is probably a very particular type of academically minded person who thinks truth is like absolutely great. It's the most aesthetically beautiful thing and we should seek to, to have it in all things. Um, and probably the everyday human experience is quite divorced from that. Um, and so that's my suspicion um, in general. And, and that worldview uh, gets expressed in, in numerous ways. Um, and uh, yeah, um, truth is not uh I'm not, uh, I think it matters because I like truth just uh, maybe for its aesthetics even. Um, I like accumulating information that is true. I find that innately uh, pleasurable. Um, But uh, I don't think that's the modal experience. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of authors who talk about um, the basis of rationality, not so, so much being truth, but rather survival. Right. And so, uh, you know, in, in, uh, especially in our field, like this uh, judgment decision making, there's, and it's usually not explicit, but it's kind of implied that people should always be making the rational choice. Um, but the rational choice always isn't, isn't always the choice that necessarily improves your chances of, you know, survival. And so others have argued like that's the more, um, you know, the rational thing is to do whatever, you know, in influences survival uh, or helps your survival. It's like uh, the two conceptions of rationality. There's um, mm-hmm. yeah. rational, instrumental rationality, which is you are rational if you're able to meet your goals, whatever they may be. And mm-hmm. then there's the epistemic rationality, which is you are rational if you are engaging with the world in a way that is sort of a, honest and true. So you're looking for truth in the world. My perspective on those two is that it's not a real dichotomy. It's instrumental rationality both times, but for people who are uh, epistemically rational, say, they just have the high value on truth. They think truth is good and they want to have a lot of it. And so their truth becomes their goal. And so they are instrumentally rational towards the goal of truth, which is the sort of epistemic rationality. Um, It seems like there was a famous article about two or three years ago in the Atlantic called, I think, How America Went Haywire. And it talks a lot about what you guys are talking about, sort of like that there's this overabundance of intellectual choice and just, I think, lifestyle choice. And you're sort of beginning to finally see the expression of the diversity of human choice, like in terms of when you're finally liberated from existential thoughts and you Mm -hmm. sort of segregate yourself or self-segregate yourself online in certain communities, um, that you're really sort of seeing this flourishing of this like haywireness, like that people are going like... I guess the I, it brings me back to this idea of Robert Putnam and social capital, this idea that sort of we have um, thick social connections which sort of ties together. And I feel like more and more we've moved into sort of these individualistic bubbles of ours where we sort of exist in various tight lanes and sort of these overarching commonalities are sort of disappearing in some way. And we can sort of, I'm a huge MMA fan, so I can love MMA YouTube videos and I'm only going to see YouTube MMA videos. Or mm-hmm. I've done research on the men's rights movement. And so if you go onto Reddit, or now it's been banned, but like if you went onto Gab, for instance, you can see these online communities to sort of socialize amongst themselves. And like 50 years ago, there was nothing really, it would have been very difficult to sort of find that analog. And today there's this like overabundance of these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it also seems there's there's kind of a more moral tinge to a lot of these you know, discussions, right? So it's not just that people are disagreeing, it's that this person disagrees with me and I can't associate with them and they should, you know, be removed from polite society and whatnot. And, and hey, sometimes that may make sense. It depends on what you're talking about. Maybe, you know, some some things do real harm and we can have that conversation, but it seems to be maybe uh, overly used in terms of things that maybe could just be disagreements are now things that, you know, separate people from even being able to associate. Mm-hmm. I think it's um, also uh, neat that we are so free from any, for, or well, not all of us in the world, obviously, but uh, where we are, we have, um, where I am at the very least, we have pretty comfortable lives where we're not really under threat of, of um, uh, like, existential risk. We're not, nobody's probably going to come kill me. Um, and that's so, during a pandemic even still. 
still really, don't have the existential risk, apparently. That's fair. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, even the pandemic, if you had to choose um, uh, from a list of disasters that could happen generationally, uh, this one has been relatively mild, assuming you can uh, avoid uh, infection. Like, obviously, I don't want to trivialize or uh, minimize the people who die. That's uh, terrible. Um, but uh, it's really cool that the same mechanisms that probably served as well in avoiding real existential threat. Like, I don't want to get eaten by a bear or attacked by a bear. Um, Those are now uh, still active in a relatively risk-free environment. And it's really cool to see those get uh, misapplied. And people's, um, uh, I think of really highly anxious people, their responses to relatively trivial inconveniences are sort of like way out of proportion as almost it would, as almost if it would be like a bear attack say um and i just think that's uh, again like really amusing and cool um to 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 see that uh, but obviously uh um i don't want to not take pleasure in any misery that people with uh, <laughs> yeah, high anxiety I, experience <laughs> so it, it's it's fun funny because you mentioned that because i remember at the start of the pandemic a lot of commentators saying well does this, you know, facing this kind of existential uh, threat, this risk of uh, disease and whatnot, does it stop a lot of these, um, you know, disagreements? Does it maybe pull us together, right? And say, hey, there's something more important than <laughs> arguing about, you know, whatever we're arguing about. Um, and I don't, I, I, I don't know if that's happened, you know, um, that'd be interesting to look at if that's happened at all. Um, but yeah, I remember that being one of the, you know, kind of hypothesis of how this is going to affect our society. To be my, my oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Martin. Uh, my guess would have been if it was something like a, a war, like there was a single unified threat that was concrete and combatable, then that probably would have been quite a unifying influence. But with this, it's kind of like a, a more nebulous thing where it's kind of like um, there's this vague sense that uh, something will get me maybe if I go outside or whatever. And there isn't really one thing that can be done about that. Um, there's, it's at the very least, it's, it's maybe multiple layers of abstraction different than uh, people with guns are in your neighborhood, and uh, they are targeting you and um, your your political um, interlocutors. And so, I wonder if um, that the spirit of that kind of uh, prediction was right. It was just like the wrong disaster for it. Yeah, and that prediction doesn't, you know didn't maybe foresee it being so politicized itself, right? COVID mm-hmm. itself has, you know, kind of uh, opinions on it has split a- along political lines to some extent, or at least they seem to have on social media. Uh, it's always tough even with that, like, you know, getting the, you know, the kind of temperature of the room from Twitter versus actually talking to people, you know, obviously you have a big, a much bigger sample on, on Twitter. You can only, you know, talk to so many people, but it does seem like there's differences there. And a lot of people have commented on that too, where we maybe we're more polarized online for a number of different reasons, whether it's, you know, the algorithms themselves or whatnot uh, versus if, you know, people talking to each other in, in person. Um, so yeah, it's tough to say, but I, it is a, kind of curious question if you know these kind of uh threats maybe uh, the the more the more harm we're exposed to or potential harm maybe you know certain things we come together a little bit and i'm not sure if that's the case uh, yeah. part of it also could be severity like um mm-hmm. and so i want to still be like sensitive to the fact that like uh, uh a, a lot of people have died and that's uh very bad um but it's not like people were facing um like a billion people dying or, or 2 billion or 3 people, billion people dying where uh, a, a significant portion of uh, people on the planet were going to, to face uh, potential death. And that probably leaves a lot of wiggle room for the mechanisms of, well, it's probably not going to affect me to sort of operate. And uh, from there, people can probably fall back into their own habits of uh, engaging in political squabbling, say. Um, but again, that that's like that's like speculation. Um, it reminds me. I don't know if you've ever read uh, Sebastian Younger and his book Tribe. It came out a couple of years ago. It's a very short book, but he looks at the tribal instincts that humans have, especially during times of crisis. And he looked at London during the bombing in World War II. He looked at Israel, I think, in 1967 or 73. And he's also looked at Native American tribes. And he's actually found that a lot of times in those moments, that suicide rates have declined and depression rates have declined. And it maybe goes to Martin's point of this idea that if it were to reach the level of sort of an existential crisis, that maybe there is sort of this cohering effect and that these secondary considerations or these maybe not as urgent ones like suicide or self-harm are sort of relegated momentarily 
while we're sort of unified under this massive crisis at a moment. But I guess maybe COVID hasn't hit that existential level mm-hmm. yet. Yeah, I buy into the spirit of it. Yeah, I just wondered mm-hmm. that. I'm glad I don't have to, you know, to have that experiment where we have to then experience a, a more severe disaster. Hopefully not. Um, that yeah. will sort of uh, like uh, have that bare truth. Yeah, if there's anything like a threat of, you know, one billion people dying or human extinction, you know, we can't really study bullshit or, or subtle language. It <laughs> kind of seems ridiculous, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Do you think, and I guess maybe we'll leave this as the parting question, it's an open-ended question, but do you think cognitively humans are undergoing maybe perhaps the most trying or transformational points in our recent history? Do you think maybe because of the access or the overabundance of information and online communities and the general absence of existential crises that we sort of are maybe at this fork in the road between sort of our evolutionary heritage of what we needed versus to be a competence human 100 years from now or 200 years from now, we're going to need very different tools? That's a good question because while the technology change, humans themselves aren't changing, right? Uh, at least not nearly a, as fast. And so, yeah, and a lot of people have, you know, that's a huge topic right now. Social media, what's it doing to us? And some people say, you know, a lot of harm. Um, and others say, well, we thought, you know, you know, we were scared of music, TV, all these technologies. There's always been some moral panic. So right. I don't know. I think there's definitely you can point to some uh, potential harms of social media. Um of course, there's probably a lot of good, right? Like during a pandemic, you know, uh, I'm, I don't live in the same province as my family. And I've, you know, and not, not through social media necessarily, but through technology, I've been able to talk to them and see them. And so there's a lot of good things. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's a question that there's not an answer to yet, but hopefully there will, we'll get more and more of an answer because a lot of people are, are looking into it. I, yeah, I'm, I'm personally quite curious about the future, but uh, I tend to, or maybe just temperamentally, I tend towards the kids are probably going to be fine. Um, and I echo uh, Alex's um, mention of the radio. People thought the radio was going to sort of rot our brains and, and TV and uh, video games. Um, I think it, it does have the potential to be, I can, I can see why arguments for it, it being quite dangerous uh, could have some merit to them. But again, I, I think maybe it's just in my temperament and this could be to my detriment because it could mean, oh, well, I'm, I might not take uh, as much aggressive action as I, I could to to prevent some ruinous harm that comes from the, the proliferation of social media. But uh, probably we're going to be fine um, as my my suspicion. Um, but it, it, uh, I, I, I don't know how much money I'd be willing to bet on that, but uh, yeah. a non-zero like it- amount. I feel like I'm a little more pessimistic. I'm not, not entirely, but and I think the change and, and people have, I think there's that, you know, there's a good documentary. I think it's called Social Dilemma yeah. uh, on Netflix. And and I think one of the changes they might point to is the algorithms. Like never have these algorithms been so personalized in getting, you know, your attention and often in negative ways. And so that's maybe a, a distinction from the radio and whatnot. Um, but but yeah, I, I don't know. I'm interesting to see how it plays out. My guess is it'll have some harms, but you know, maybe though they won't be you know ruinous, and maybe the benefits will be in line with those harms. Right. Amazing. Thank you so much, Alex and Martin, for chatting with us. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but this was awesome. I think it all met itself like in one Zoom call, so I don't think we'll have to cut anything. Awesome. Yeah. No. Thank you uh, for having us on and and for the conversation. I really enjoyed it. Amazing. And hopefully we'll have you guys on again when you have some more papers to talk about and and all that type of stuff. But it's been amazing. And I think it's really, really cool research. For sure. Thank you. Excellent. Wicked. Thank you. Thank you again, guys. Have a good one. Stay safe. And hopefully maybe we'll eventually be able to see each other in person sometime. Yeah, the next one we'll do in person. (laughs) Yeah. Look forward to it. Amazing, guys. Have a good one. Enjoy the rest of your weeks. You as well. Bye.